You know, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, a bittersweet for me, number one, to, uh, to be up here interviewing my good friend. We've been through a, a lot of uh, trials and tribulations together, uh, but clearly we're sitting in a beautiful facility, and we're going to talk about his great work from 1989 to 2016 as part of the Central Arkansas Library System, but I'm going to get him uh, talking about Helena and the Civil War and Knox Nelson and Bill Clinton and <laughs> other things too. So we're going to do library, but then we're going to have a little fun talking about uh, Bobby Roberts, the character uh, that he is and the characters that he has been around. But Bobby, in 1992, I think, I mean, clearly there's no doubt that you, uh, more than any one individual, if, if it's true that James Carville changed the way elections were run, you changed the scope of public libraries in Arkansas. And you, uh, in 1992, were instrumental in the passage of a constitutional amendment uh, that made it possible for so many libraries all over Arkansas to grow and to expand. So would you talk about, it's not called the Roberts Amendment, though Nate, <laughs> though Nate Coulter and I do call it the Roberts Amendment. So would you talk about that, how it passed, what it did, and how you must feel looking at the fruits of your labor? Sure. Um, I think that 1992 election when we uh, did finally amend the Constitution in Arkansas it fundamentally changed the, the way libraries operate, and it came about um, in a number of ways, the Arkansas Library Association had tried to change the Constitution. The Constitution uh, before 1992 said the most that any uh, city or county could vote for a library was one mill. Uh, when that was done in the 40s, that was a pretty progressive piece of legislation, but by the 1990s, it was killing libraries. This library system was the worst funded urban library in America uh, in 1989, 1990. It was on the verge of collapse, and the reason was that not that people didn't support it, but they couldn't support it. Uh, and we do that all the time in Arkansas. We say, well, you, you know, this is the best government you can have. You can raise five mills for property tax and no more. You can raise one mill for libraries and that's it. You know, it's, it's undemocratic as hell as far as I'm concerned to do it that way. But that's how we were doing it. So there had been an attempt to change it by the Arkansas Library Association. That failed. Uh, I have been on and off working for Governor Clinton from 1983 uh, until I uh, went to work for uh, the Cal system. Uh, I got a call from somebody from Clinton's office saying, would you come back up here and work the session? We need you to come back up here. And I said, that, yeah, I will if the board of trustees will let me come up there. And I called Sherry Walker, and Sherry Walker said, you can go if you can get the governor to support a new amendment to the libraries. <laughs> and I said, well, I think we can do that. And so uh, he said, yeah, 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 you know, he didn't care. That's fine, you know, we're going to do that. So I got Bill Spivey. Uh, a good friend of mine, we, we drafted up what became that uh, amendment and we put it in to get it passed. Um, one of my great allies in that was Jay Bradford. There's never been a better friend of public libraries in, in the Arkansas General Assembly than Jay Bradford. Jay was over in the, in the House State Agencies Committee uh, and a guy named Frank Willems was over in the House and chaired the House State Agency Committee. The way it worked in those days, there were three constitutional amendments you could put on the ballot. The House would pick one, the Senate would pick one, and then they'd argue over the third one. Well, we were not a high priority for them, so the House had picked an amendment, the Senate had picked an amendment, and we were trying to get the third amendment. Well, Jay was in the, in the House uh, uh, committee, and he steered it through there and shot it over to the House uh, state agencies. And all this happens right at the end of the session. There's about 19 amendments we're competing with, and we need 11 votes to get the thing out of committee, and we have nine. And that's all we've got. There are two people in there that I, I can see them today. I won't mention their names, but I get mad every time I think about them. They were, they were, they were a couple of lawyers. They were well-educated. They should have supported that amendment, and they would not. So Mr. Willems, who I never could decide Mr. Willems was the smartest guy I ever dealt with or just got all confused that day. But they were right before the session was going to start, and, and they, they were debating these amendments. and. and and we couldn't get 11 votes to get the thing out of there. 
And so Mr. Williams said, well, we've got these 19 amendments. He said, we're going to go down the list and we're going to pick out uh, the three amendments that we want to discuss and then, and then we're going to discuss those amendments. And he says, who wants to talk about the library amendment? All of them said yes. And he said, do pass. And everybody jumped up in the air and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we'll just put it on the list. And he said, well, the House has gone into session. We can't take any more action. Send it up to the House floor. And out it went. Um, whether or not that was an accident or Mr. Williams was the most clever. Don, you're back there in the back. You knew Mr. Williams. I don't know, uh, Mr. Williams, I don't know how clever he was, but it certainly worked in our favor. So it kind of got out by just by chance. And then... Uh, it was on the ballot when Bill Clinton was running. That was in 91, so it was on the ballot you know, in 92 when uh, Bill Clinton was running for governor. Most people had a library, or were for president. Most of the people in the library uh, operation were working on amendment, what was called in Amendment 3. And uh, we were able to get it passed. And I might say, Skip, the president got 53% of the vote. We got 59%. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other bad thing that happened in that session, we passed term limits. That was the fourth amendment on the ballot. Uh, and that's been a disaster, I think, for the state. But, but for libraries, that opened up the way then to have a, an election. The new amendment said you could ask the voters to vote up to five mills for operations and three mills for bond and indebtedness. And without that, the system was on the verge of collapse. So that opened the door uh, in, in a freaky sort of way. That's how it, that's how it got paid. There's no skill involved in it, just luck, mostly. And libraries all over Arkansas have taken advantage of that. Not as many as I'd like, but a number of them have. Uh, we've taken advantage of it with a vengeance. We've used it more than anyone. We've run, by my count, 20 elections under that under that amendment. And I'll show you what those look like in a minute. So, Bobby, when you became director of the library, it was in the old library. Uh, would you talk about sort of, like, we've already talked about sort of the underfunding, but, but what it was like going into that, I remember it well. And then how did you, um, how did you have the vision of the phones building and, and being able to transform that? I mean, obviously that was you took advantage of an election. I understand that one. But what 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 did you think when you walked in and and, and it was you know old historic building and then you went to the phones? How'd you do all that? Well, I ended up at the public library just on a lark. I didn't have any. I didn't have a library card. I'd been in this <laughs> public library once or twice because I had I'm a Civil War historian by training. And they had the Civil War Times Illustrated and the Confederate Veteran uh, in that old library. And they used to go and use it all the time. So I, I don't think about a library at all. And uh, Sherry Walker called me up and said, we're getting ready to make a change. I was sitting in my apartment drinking a beer and watching a baseball game. <laughs> and I said, you know, Sherry, I don't know anything about this. I, don't, I, you know, I barely know where the place is. And I, we talked for a while. And I said, how much does it pay? And it paid, it sounds like an enormous fortune at the time, $60,000. And I was making about forty. So I told Sheriff, I'll be down there Monday. <laughs> and I went down there, and, and uh, I, I literally didn't know uh, how to get back to the office. And so I started from scratch. I know Nate, my, my great replacement, thinks he's starting from ground zero, but I was way below ground zero. I, I didn't have anybody tell me anything. Uh, and uh, the deputy director came in and started talking to him, and he was, you know, kind of what do you expect? And I said, well, I'll tell you what I don't like. I don't like surprises. And so with, with that in mind, I started uh, working my way through it. And we had a really, I had a really good group of people uh, reporting to me uh, in that early days. Uh, Martha Priest, uh, Margaret Copley, Linda Bly, Larry Thompson, and then Susan Chandler is here today, came on later in that group, Bob Razor. We had a great staff, and we had a pretty good collection, but we didn't have any money. And so this is 1989, so we're not going anywhere until that until that election in, uh, takes place uh, in 92. The amendment uh, goes into effect in 93, and as soon as it got on the ballot, North Little Rock was the first one to run an election under that new village, and they won. And then in May of that year, I think it was May, we ran four um, races uh, uh, under that new amendment. We'd run one earlier, which I'll show you, but we ran four races in there, and I thought we lost all four of them. Uh, Kathy and I were, were dating at the time. That was in the old days where you had to go out and look at the, look at the, uh, go out to the precincts and get everything off. And so Kathy and I went out to Southwest Little Rock. There were 14 precincts out there. We lost every one of them. And we were having a party up at the house, and I got back in the house, and I thought, well, that, that, we've lost all of those. And of course, we carried every other precinct in the whole county except those 14 precincts <laughs> in Southwest Little Rock. And I have never carried all those 14 precincts ever in any election we've run. I've gotten close, but I've never gotten all of them. So um, 
Nate, maybe next time around you, you get all of them, I hope. Anyway, that's how we got started. So then with the phones building, tell us about the, the what did you see it when you walked in the building? I mean, how did you? Oh, it's another one of these. No vision involved in this, let me say. The idea that there's any vision. Uh -huh. <laughs> this building, the old phones building was in receivership. And uh, again, Bill Spivey rises to the occasion. Bill was the lawyer for whoever had it in receiverships down in Pine Bluff. He's just worrying me about looking at the building. We had passed the millage, so we had some money to build the building. And uh, he was just on me all the time, you know, look at the building. I thought, okay, I'll go down and look at the phone building just to shut him up because I don't want to listen to him anymore. <laughs> and so we took the architects down and looked at it. And, you know, it, underneath all the pigeon poop and, and, and the water in it and everything else, it structurally was in good shape. Uh, and it was in a great location, if you think about it. We're a system operating uh, in most of Pulaski County. It sits right in the middle of Pulaski County. It's close to the interstate. It was a perfect location for us, and it was cheap, and we didn't have a lot of money to spend. And so we kind of fell into it literally by accident, but it has been, in my opinion, uh, one of the great buildings that the library got involved in. And because I told somebody, it's like, you believe buildings have a spirit, uh, that thing was sitting there wanting to do something uh, and it, it wanted to be a library and it turned into a wonderful building. It's been a great, we never had much trouble with it. So it just turned out to be a wonderful asset for the library and gave us a big visible piece of property that people could see and relate to. And I think it made a big difference in what happened in the, in the system in the future. And capturing your love for history, you've also done a pretty good job at retrofitting, readapting other buildings in including the one next door where we have a school campus, including uh, where your bookends coffee shop is. Uh, did you set out to do it that way? Did you, did you look at those buildings and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna pass the millage and readapt you? <laughs> no, we, we didn't come. In, in the case of the, of the Cox building, we bought the Cox building to get enough parking out here to have a parking lot. And then we had the building and didn't know what to do with it. As this area started developing, um, I had developers come and tell me almost on a weekly basis wanting to buy that building and, and use it for something else. And I felt like if the river market was going to be successful, it needed to have a big public footprint in it. And that building, if you think about it, it sits right at the other end of, the, of what's now the campus. It's a wonderful building and it was in pretty good shape. I thought, we need to do something with it. We, and, if, and if we do something with it, then the developers will leave me alone because they won't they won't be able to nag me about selling it and the pressure gets to mount. So, so we sort of went into it with, with that. I do think, if you want to talk about the five or six reasons this library system is different than any of them in the country, I think that purchase of that building and the decision to create that uh, restaurant and that bookstore in it uh, and to have staff arts over it was one of the first things we did that put the library off on a little bit different course than most public libraries are on. Not to say a lot of them don't have that but if you look at it in the totality of other things we've done, I think that was the first step down a different path for the library. Your uh, friendship of and great admiration for um, Richard Butler and the Butler family has led to uh, a fabulous resource for our city and our state, the, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. Can you can you talk about your, your, your plan for that, how it happened, and uh, what you see in the future for it? Sure. Uh, as I say, I'm a Civil War historian by training and a historian uh, in, in the broadest sense of the word, I guess. And if you get in a job, you get to indulge your interest. And so I was interested in Arkansas history. Uh, we had a very small Arkansas collection. Uh, Tom Dillard went to work for us. Uh, he was a good friend of Richard Butler. Uh, I got to know Richard and, and uh, enjoyed Richard as much as any human I guess I've ever dealt with. I always liked Richard. He, he and I didn't agree about anything politically or anything, but he was a great guy to deal with. And so Tom and I decided, well, let's ask him for some money and see if he'd help us start this Arkansas history collection. And I said, well, well, how much are we going to ask him for? We said, well, we don't know, but we'll take him out. He took us out to the country club. And if you know Richard, he's long drawn out stories kind of like me, and he's talking to us, and he's, I never will forget, he's sitting there, and he's got this piece of lemon pie. He's cut it off. And he's got it on his fork, and you think, is he going to drop it or is he going to put it in his mouth? I'm not sure what he's going to do. And we were talking with him about money. He said, well, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, 
I'll give you $50,000 now, write your check for $50,000, or I'll give you $100,000 in my will, which one do you want? And I, Tom and I sat there and looked at him and said, we'll take the $100,000 in the will. He said, you made the right choice. Uh, and he would want us to look down the road, which we, which we did, and then Richard became the benefactor of the Butler Center uh, and left us a sizable uh, endowment uh, when he died. Uh, and it took off from there. But it started out, and you could have put the entire Arkansas collection on this stage probably when we started it. So it has been a phenomenal uh, success. Uh, and Richard, you know, Richard and Tom were the right people at the right time to get it started. And luckily, Tom and I asked the right question. Again, it was just, it was just luck that that's the one we picked. And, and Richard finally got that piece of pie in his mouth, but I was again wondering where it was going to go. And you built that collection. You've got not only, the, if you point out the great Civil War stuff that you've been certainly instrumental in, but very prominent Arkansas politicians and everything ranging from, I mean, even the collection of the Farkleberry Follies. Uh, but, but, but talk about the Clinton gubernatorial papers, and particularly in light of, of her uh, running for president in 2016. Oh, I followed the Clinton gubernatorial papers around the, the first time he ran and was defeated, those papers were transferred out to UALR where I worked in the archives. And we had an agreement, we didn't own them, but then we were just holding them in case he ever ran for election again. Uh, when he decided to finally run for president, I helped move those papers down to their headquarters. Uh, by that time they had grown, and I generated some of them on his staff, and the way that was done, uh, when my file cabinet got full, I went down and got a box and stuffed a bunch of stuff in it and threw it down there in storage. So they were in disrepair, to say the least. But uh, the day he was elected president, uh, I got a letter off to him saying, we'd like to have the gubernatorial papers. And here's why. If you stick them in the federal repository, they're going to be well cared for, but they're interested, they're really interested in your federal years, not your state years. So if you, if you split them up and give them to us, you'll have a facility that'll deal more with your years uh, as governor. And he saw the logic of that and eventually uh, gave us custody of the papers. We don't own them all yet, and I've been trying to get him to go ahead and open those papers up. Uh, we're right on the verge of at least opening up the education papers, and I hope he'll do that. He's not going to do it before I retire, but I hope he'll do it, he'll do it soon because I think, think those education papers and those six weeks in October of 1983 when uh, we were in a special session to try to improve education in Arkansas. Those six weeks are the most crucial period probably in the history of the state since World War II because it cast us in the direction of at least trying to have a better school system. And we got a long way to go with it, but I haven't seen any governor since that session back away from trying to improve the school district. So those education papers, I think, are extremely important to understand, one, what happened to education in Arkansas, but two, how Bill Clinton rose up from the political dead uh, and became a viable uh, regional and then a national figure. Because he certainly wasn't that before that election. If you go back and look at what the paper was saying about him and what was going on, he was not going to make the move that he made. So I think it's a crucial six weeks in his history and, and in the history of the state. One Don the, Ernst was a legislative uh, liaison in that deal, uh, and when I saw Don, I thought he was about 12 years old. I, thought, I, I was 30. Don must have been 20. I mean, that's how young we were when this was going on. That's well, let, you know, we all look so old now. That's what the Clinton world will do to you. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the one of the one of the things you did that I think uh, I really think will go down is. Is one of your monumental accomplishments and decisions is that you led the effort and built a children's library on the other side of 630. And you made a statement that that interstate was not going to prevent you from doing something big over there. As we are in a great debate about an interstate through the city. Can you talk about that decision, the importance of locating the children's library there, and, and uh, what what was your thinking? Sure. Let me let me talk about 
why we built it in the first place. Uh, and there, there, are two, there are two routes to it. Uh, Lisa Donovan's back there in the back, I saw her somewhere. Raise your hand, Lisa. Where I, Lisa and I used to have these conversations. I'd, I'd come in with something from some church or school or something that was doing all these good programs that, that all the kids could go to if they had $100. And it really got under my skin that we didn't have a public place where children could go and get the kind of enrichment that they ought to be getting. You can get it in Little Rock, but you gotta have money to get it. So we needed something like that. The second thing is a little bit more practical. And that was, uh, we've been behind the eight ball, I'll show you some election, we've been high, behind the eight ball and operating the library for 12 or 13 years. And in order to keep doing it, we've had to build more things to get more money in the system, but then you gotta pay for all of them. Uh, and the children's library, in a sense, was necessary to pay off what we had done in ASI, which was bigger than we thought it would be. But the way it came about, about two years before that, there was a jail election in the county. You may remember that, we tried the countywide tax to expand the jail and it failed. I went, the first thing I do, I already, already looked at the, at the transit election incidentally about what happened in it yesterday. First thing I do is get the precincts out and start looking and see what happened. And I looked at that jail tax and I thought, you know, they only lost that tax in the county, they didn't lose it in Little Rock. And if we put something on the ballot in Little Rock that's attractive, we can pass it. And what would be attractive? Something that would take care of what Lisa and I have been talking about, which is do something for the children. And let's put it south of 630, because that's where it needs to go. And we need to concentrate our resources south of 630. And so we put it on the ballot, put an operational military zone, and it passed, and you know, we were able to build it. Um, and it was a combination of most things I've seen happen with me and most things that work. Part of it's a practical issue, and part of it's something I think the community needs. And they, they have to come together, I think. It doesn't do any good to have something that the community needs and not have any practical way to get it done. So I tend to look at elections and uh, won or lost and figure out how that tells me something about what we could be doing. So that's how it got, how it got going. There was, uh, on this site, um, a proposed hotel that you uh, were uh, visceral in your opposition to. <laughs> Uh, but as you said, uh, you know, there are better ways that we can use this land and I'll even work with those that I have <coughs> opposed uh, on the hotel to find a way that we can do something good on this site, which led, of course, to the arcade building. Uh, can you talk about, one, fighting the hotel, number two, building the bridge, and number three, uh, this great, wonderful facility? Sure. Uh one of the things I learned working for Bill Clinton, and particularly from Betsy Wright, was um, everything that you deal with is a situational issue. And now that I mean, you really don't need to have any friends and, or enemies, either one, in politics. You never know how, how things are going to wash out. And uh, I did get crossways with some of my friends about building a hotel here, uh, but I didn't take it personally, and I don't think they took it. I hope they didn't take it personally about my opposition. Uh, I felt like it was a bad thing to do for the library. It was a simple deal. We were finishing off the Arkansas Studies Institute. I felt like it was a bad uh, decision for the library. My job is, is not, I'm not a developer. Uh, if, if we happen to play a role in development, that's fine. But my job is to protect the interests of the taxpayers uh, who own this library system. And I thought that was going to be a bad thing. Uh, I thought it was a bad thing for the river market, but I certainly thought it was a bad thing for the library. So I just, you know, I remember going to a meeting and I got all, get all that spiel from all your buddies, you know, about what a good deal this is and why are you out of line and all this. And I told them, I said, well, I said, you and I just got to disagree about it. But I said, if you try to, win that, try to build that hotel over here, you're going to run over me and, and what I can pull out. And I told them, I said, y'all going to have a great inside game, but we're going to have a great outside game. It's going to take us a while to get organized, but when we do, uh, we'll put up a good fight. And that's basically true of institutions like this. Uh, the, the quick inside game uh, uh, with the power structure is going to work against you, but the long game works in your favor. And that's what happened in that. Uh, and then as luck would have it, the same people were trying to build a Bayloft Hotel uh, are now partners in this with us. So that's why I, uh, I think everybody would agree it worked out. But it was a nasty business while it was going on. Even Skip and I disagreed. Yeah, but you know, I, that wasn't the first time. It won't be the last, but we have a campus in this building too, so 
But we do share a mutual friend, uh, one that uh, we uh, have known and, and uh, shared stories with a long time, and that is Ron Robinson, uh, for whom this theater uh, is named, and whom, as we both know, may have the biggest, largest personal collection of historical memorabilia in, in the state. Um, you uh, worked with Ron on the naming of this theater and the donation of materials. Can you talk about that and what this theater has meant to downtown Little Rock? Sure. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you know Ron, but Ron is like talking to a great big game of trivia. Uh, no matter what you bring up, he's going to have not just a few questions about it. He's going to try to tell you who the producer was, or I'm going to ask you who the producer was of some movie you've never heard in 1942. So he's got what I call a garbage brain. It's just full of facts and information, and you hear them all the time. And he's also a, a great collector. He's got 10 or 15,000 movie posters, a huge collection of stuff. And Ron and I have been friends for 20 or 30 years, and uh, I thought if we could He's got a wonderful Arkansas music collection and a wonderful Arkansas memorabilia collection. And I thought if we could get that collection, get him to commit that collection to the Butler Center, uh, it would be uh, a wonderful thing. David Strickland is a good friend of, of Ron's, and so you know we kept working on him. We were going to do this theater. Ron loves movies. Uh, I, I, I'll give you his phone number, that served him right. And you know, call him up and say, you know, who was the producer of The Sands of Iwo Jima? He just spit it right out. And, I mean, you know, he's an amazing person. But I, there's not anything that would be more fitting for Ron to have um, named after him than a movie theater. And so it's a perfect fit. Uh, and we were going to get the collection. It worked for both of us. The only bad thing about it was that Ron then wants to tell you how to design everything and how everything should look and still give me advice. I'm now passing along to Nate, giving me advice about how the theater operates. So good luck, Nate. <laughs> but he's a great guy, really. Talk about the naming of your branch libraries. Um, we have tried to name those branches uh, after someone in the community that matters, uh, that's important to people, or someone that has done something important in Arkansas, uh, and to try to get a balance in it. Uh, we're a diverse community. Uh, we ought to recognize that when we're doing things. And so we've gone out of our way to make sure that uh, that we do that. On the other hand, I don't like to fall into the trap of saying, well, this is an African-American area, so we can only name an African-American building over here. This is a white area, so we can only name it. I don't think that's necessarily healthy. So in one particular case, we just flipped those when we were building uh, uh, what came to Thompson Library and the McMath Library at the same time. And we decided we would name the Thompson Library after Roosevelt Thompson, a wonderful uh, young African-American who was killed all too young in a car wreck. And we would take McMath, who to me is an under-recognized governor, is important, particularly in civil rights issue, and put it uh, over where it is in McMath and flip-flop. So we've tried to, to, to do what we can to, to sort of even out the community and try to deal with some of the, the racial and divides that we have in the community that uh, we sometimes uh, would rather just not talk about than to try to deal with them. So we've tried to, you know, to make sure we do, do the right thing and make sure we represent the community. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job. So where do you see the library going in the digital age? What about, the, what, what, what do you see? Um, why don't we look at these three slides? Okay, that's Can you turn those slides on? Let me take them, and we're going to do it a little later. But this, this is the, one of the slides, by the way, is Bobby's election history. You, you will see the most. Look at this: the most successful person in Arkansas political history, right here. <laughs> The 1990 election, uh, which was running a general election up in Perry County, was a very important election for us. I think I've been here about six months, and uh, we decided that that library really needed to be improved. Uh, and we decided we would run a millage up there. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to raise any money. We didn't know anything except what a little bit I had learned, particularly from Betsy and, and Bill Clinton, to a lesser extent, about running these campaigns. But there were a lot of things that we tried in that campaign that we won that we were later able to use in the rest of it. And they were things like um, 
ask for a reasonable amount of money and tell people what you're going to do with it. Don't try to do everything at once. Do, do a little at a time. Uh, make sure people understand what they're paying. When you start talking about a half mil or two mils or one mil, people don't understand. It. Make sure they can understand what it's going to cost them and what they're going to get. So we ran, uh, uh, Haynes Ware, who used to work for us, did this great little ad we ran on the radio, and you could hear this Coke can open, you could hear it fizz in the radio. And he would say, you know, we'd say, all right, now you're having lunch and you're about to have a Coke. Well, if you give up that one Coke a month, you know, you can have a better library. So <laughs> try to put it in those kind of terms. And it worked. And Kathy and I were up there at that election in Perry County. And it, one, one box would come in and we'd lose. And one would come in and we would win. And one would come in and we would lose. And we won by about 100 votes. And we had promised to build up a new library. Uh, which we did. And the other thing was to make sure if we said we were going to do something to the best of our ability, we did it. That set the stage for, for those, 19, those four 1993 elections. That's when the system took off. Uh, that's when we finally had enough money to operate it and to make it function like it should. In 97, I outsmarted myself. I had this idea. I said, well, if I go in in a general election and I lower <laughs> The bond and indebtedness from, it was at two mils, lower that from two mils to one mil, I'll raise the operations, which is what this library always needs, and everybody will be fine because the taxes won't be anymore. And what happened in that election is they voted to lower the taxes but not to raise them. I thought, well, that was not a, that was not a good plan. But then it dawned on me, well, we got the bonds refinanced, we had another $12 million to spend. Uh, but, uh, the, the one that really, I think the library has suffered from badly and has never really caught up on it is that one in 2001 uh, where we asked for a straight out operational increase in Little Rock and one in, in Pulaski County. And we won the one in Little Rock, but we lost the one in Pulaski County. And that cost us about a million dollars a year in operational money, that loss in Pulaski County. And then we faced the question of, do we, do we punish the, the county libraries because they didn't vote for how do we do that? We decided now everybody's in the system will treat them the same. This library has been running about a million dollars behind where it should be since that election and it's compounded later on with the, with the recession which I'll talk about. Uh, the rest of them were, you know, pretty, pretty simple. Um, uh, we had the formula for it. Uh, the better the system gets, the easier it is to raise money for it. I feel terribly sad and sorry for that transit tax not passing uh, yesterday. That should have passed. They're in the same situation we were in 25 years ago. And, and if you don't give them some money, they're not going to improve transit. They cannot do it without the proper support. And it's terrible that they lost. But I'm convinced from the numbers that, that Jimmy Moses is right. They can win that if, if they do it again and, and take another shot at it, do it the right time, they can win it. Uh, but anyway, the, the one that's the most interesting one to me is this one. This Sherwood Capital Improvement Fund. That's like, uh, that's, that's that, like Dewey, Trinity Beat and Dewey. Well, people ask me the toughest race we ever ran, and why I was most surprised after when it was that race. Uh, we had, because of me, uh, we had not gotten along very well with the city board out there. Uh, in fact, I, I, I told somebody after, after that election was over, I said, you know, after I, that run in I had out in Sherwood, I thought, he's probably. It's probably time for me to resign and retire because I've lost my patience uh, to put up with things and then you reach a point where you just don't want to do it anymore. But anyway, we didn't have a good, uh, good situation there. We had an uh, organized opposition to it, uh, but we had, we had two, good, two or three things going for us. One is we could raise enough money to spend more on it. And the problem with special elections, and nobody's going to believe this, but I'll say it anyway, problem with special collection, not the turnout that kills you. It's the fact that in order to talk to a larger turnout, you have to have more money. And so if you're running an issue and you have to raise $150,000 or $200,000 to run a race in a general election, it's much more difficult to get the money. Uh, it's, and you don't die over the, uh, over the turnout, you die over the fact that you can't talk to the turnout. That's what really gets you. Well, we had enough money to run that race because I got irritated and found as much money as we could to put into the private money to run the thing. And then we, we had Amy Sanders, who the library is named after, 
uh, and Jan Swindle, who runs that library, who were forces of being in the community. They had a huge network, and we just beat the opposition with money and a network, and it passed 53%. I was amazed that it passed. There were two taxes in the entire state that passed. It was a route for the Democrats that was unprecedented in Arkansas history, and yet that, that passed in one other tax. So it, it was the toughest one we got into, and part of that was because of my own making, I might say. It was not... I didn't help matters out. So anyway, there they are. We didn't win all of them, but we won enough of them. Uh, but I still think that 2001 was tough. So run the next slide up while we're sitting here. Skip's got a little dance for you. While <laughs> no, I'm just amazed at all those victories. Don't ask me to put up a slide for my campaign. <laughs> Bobby, if you were, while we're doing this, we do ask a question. When, when do you end, I'm not, because this is Nate's deal, but how long do you think it'll be before we're in the position to do this again? I'll show you the third slide. Oh, okay. All right, Nate. <laughs> show where the library is. There it is, laid out for you. By the way, I want to give Mary Dillard some credit for this. Mary Dillard yes, is one of Mary, of Mary Dillard is one of us in this campaign. And you cannot run a race without somebody like Mary to, to make sure the message is right and to keep you on target and keep you on schedule to run it. And so many. Uh, Good races are lost, I think, because people don't raise enough money to do it, and they don't get a good campaign consultant that keeps you on the schedule so you know what you're doing and keeps you on the message uh, and not let you drift off. Uh, I guess one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is uh, they get more interested in the people that are voting against them than the ones that are for them. Uh, so and it doesn't take long to figure it out. If you're going to run a race in, in Little Rock, you want it's a tax race, you want to pass it. You better do a lot of work in Hillcrest and the Heights, because that's where those boats are that, that'll carry you through. So every dollar you spend there is going to be more useful than the ones you spend in West or Southwest Little Rock, where you're going to get 40, 45 percent of the boat. And it's hard, you know. I catch myself this way. I think my cause, whatever it is, is so good that everybody ought to believe in it. And when they don't, I want to convince them that that it's something they ought to support. But in fact, stick with the people that already support. When you say, Mary, you know, don't. If we start running to people that are opposed to us, we just don't talk to them anymore. <clears throat> just let them go away. Don't make them mad. Just, you know, take them out of the game if you can. I'll tell you what that next slide is, if we can see it. Um, well, one of it is a question about, about bonded indebtedness, which is the most fascinating number to me. Um, I'm a, sit down, Bobby. <laughs> I'm used to walking around. I know. Oh. <laughs> I started, I've kept this number for a long time to look at, uh, at the amount of money that the voters have approved in Pulaski County for library construction. It's $162 million. That's more money that the voters have approved for Altel Arena, for the new Robinson Auditorium, and for the new Art Center. And they've approved more money for public libraries. And those are all worthwhile projects, but the Robinson Auditorium and the Art Center stand on a special tax that only tourists and people going out to eat pay. The only one out of that three that stands on a general tax uh, that was passed uh, was the Altel Arena. Ours are all general taxes. Everybody's paying those taxes. Um, so if you look at the general taxes, you get the Altel Arena, Dickey Stevens, which is not in our service area, but you, you can count that one, and I'm missing one. Oh, the jail. And we beat them by about $40 million. So the voters have been willing to put money in the public library system. And the reason I think they do it is, one of the sad things that's happened in this country to me is we have become <coughs> disconnected from taxes and what we want. So everybody wants, you know, whatever, the affordable health care, new highways, all that stuff, as long as it doesn't cost them any money. And you can't do that. If you don't want to pay for it, 
then you can't, this library can't run, this it takes $45,000 a day to keep this thing running. Now, if you don't want a good library system, cut it back to $35,000 and see what happens to it. It'll, it'll begin to decline. And when it starts to decline, people won't blame it on them for not giving you the money. They'll blame it on Nate because he doesn't know how to run the library system. Uh, they'll blame the system for the fact that they don't have enough money. And so you have to connect them together. What's impressive to me about the library is people have been willing to do that. People have been willing to say, okay, this is what it's going to cost. I'll put the money in it, and the, and the community will benefit from it. So I'm one of the few Democrats probably in the world that supports a balanced budget amendment. Because I think absent that, we have lost our way. If you, if, you, if you made everybody say, this is all the good things we want, but you can't get them unless you pay for them, we'd be better off. Uh, and I think that's why this system has been able to make the progress that it has, is because people have been willing to put money in it. Pure and simple. Take, it's not me. It, it, it's, it's, it's the fact that they have given the library enough money to buy what they need to run it and to run it right and to run it the way you want it to be run. You do the, the, the transit, they're going to do just as well. Pick, pick it out. You pick out whatever it is. The museums, parks, anything else. You give them the right amount of money, it'll be a better system. But we don't seem to want to do that anymore. That's my little preach about where we are in this country right now. If you're going to ask me that question. Well, no, I wasn't, but I'm sort of glad to hear it. <laughs> I figured I'm, I'm going to get you on another couple topics, but I do, and while the, if or when the slides work, talk, do you have a brief thing on the, on the future of digital? Where, where are you seeing it? What, 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 what are libraries having to fix? What, what are we going to see the library in the next 10 to 15 years? Well, imagine this slide behind you um, <laughs> that I had up there. I, I went back and, and looked at what, what's happened to the library in terms of its use from 2008. 2015. Pick 2008 because that's when the recession started. Because the second hammer that's fallen on the library is what it fell on a lot of y'all, and that's the recession. We're not immune from it, and we've not recovered from it. But if you look at the last seven or eight years, our circulation is still pretty good. Our attendance is pretty good. Our internet is not growing real fast because it's maxed out on the capacity we have. Our meeting room use is not growing a lot because it's maxed out. What is growing really fast are, are um, children's programming and adult programming. Uh, one of them's up 118% in the last eight years, one of them's up 115%. So the library is being used in different ways by the community. And I'm convinced that the library, one of its great values and the reason it works so well is it responds to what the community wants. There's nothing out there that's as close to the public as the public library because it's locally funded and it's locally controlled and so it responds in ways that schools and other things I think don't do as well uh, because you're the people that fund the library not the state of Arkansas not the federal government the taxpayers fund this thing so you got you got that going on the other thing is I tried to figure out this is a hard number to get uh, and I'm accused of being a bean counter. I really am. I like things I can count. The easiest thing to count in the library is circulation. That you know what that is. And it, but digital circulation is kind of hard to calculate to get the numbers right. But the best I could do to figure this out, if you looked at the percentage of the people coming to the library digitally, as opposed to people coming <coughs> physically, um, eight years ago, about about. 44, 45, maybe 48 percent of the people were coming here to get their services. That's down to about 36 percent. The digital part has gone up. Now that's going to continue, and that's going to put pressure on the library, I think, to uh, perform in different ways. Uh, there's six things I think that's made this make this library different. The Cox building, the building of that building over there starting of the, it just gave us a different way to look at selling books and having you know, events like that. The Encyclopedia of Arkansas History, uh, which uh, Tom Dillard started with the help of the Rockefeller Foundation the Department of Arkansas Heritage, it now has almost as many visitors a day as the entire system has physically. That's how big it is. Uh, it's a major source for Arkansas history and it pushed us in a different direction. The literary festivals we took over, uh, which gives us another whole outreach uh, that we didn't have. Arkansas Studies Institute, which cast us in a, in a major way into Arkansas uh, history. 
Uh, the Children's Library, there's nothing like it in the country. Uh, I had a young reporter in here from France that went out to look at it and was bragging on it. Uh, and the Ryan Robinson Theater. Those things all push this library in a different direction. The, the core of it's still there. The library part of it's still there. It's functioning fine. It's going to do a lot of good. What makes the library different, I think, are those six things that are out there. Uh, and, and I think we've responded pretty well to the digital world. It's hard to turn a big ship around like this to get it moving in that direction. Now, what's scary about it in this mythical charter here, <laughs> in order for us to keep this library running, and for Nate to keep it running, uh, he needs at least 2 to 3% growth in income every year. That's to pay for a little bit of salary increases, pay for medical care, pay for upkeep on the buildings. You've got to have a 3% growth. If you don't get that, then sooner or later, you're going to start running out of resources. If you look at what the tax, property tax has done in 2008, which was the last year before the recession hit the property taxes, uh, this system was collected about 6.9% annually, anywhere from 5 to 6.9 was what we were running, which was more than enough to keep it going and to make up that million dollar hole that's been in it. But since then, the best year we've had is 4.1. We've had only one year in the entire history I've here, I've been here that the village has been down, and that was during that 2008 period. It went down, and this year it's only going to go up 1.7 percent. Now, here's what's going to happen: either at some point that expenditure line is going to get so far out of line with the revenues that the service the library can provide is going to start deteriorating. And when it does it, the cycle I was just talking about, about, well, they don't know what they're doing down there, and it, you know, we don't know, we're not going to fund it, starts in, and it's hard to get off of it. Or you're going to have to go back, Nate, to the public sometime and ask them for uh, a regular operational increase. Uh, and that's a, big, that's a big proposition to do. Uh, I had, frankly, run out of energy by the time I got where I am to do, do something like that. You need $150,000 at least to do it now, I think. And you got to work on it for five or six months, and you know, a guy 71 years old just doesn't want to jump in that in that kind of thing. But I, that's what I think where we are is the system's in great shape. There's plenty of funding to keep it going four or five years. But at some point, and and I've been counting on that on that economy to pick up, and it's a mystery to me. I read the paper, I look at it. You know, it looks like those property tax rates ought to be going up, but they are not climbing like they should, and that's going to. That's the problem I think the library faces. So uh, next week, you are the former retired director. What's in Bobby Roberts' plans? I know <coughs> there's not, Kathy's not going to let you sit at home and tell her what to do. <laughs> she, she, you may be tried for a couple of weeks, but you'll be <laughs> doing something either by force or by choice, um, and I don't blame her. Um, so what what do you see? I don't really know. I tell Kathy's a person that likes to work. She was out in the yard working yesterday, and I said, I, I separate people like work in, in, in the two kinds. People like Kathy that believe in the dignity of work, and they love it and do it cheerfully, and there are people like me that believe in the necessity of work, and I just do it because I had to have a paycheck. So for me to get to say I'm going to get out and do something, is a big stretch to, to think what I'll do. I'm by training a historian, um, and that's a much more difficult job than being uh, an administrator. Because administrative stuff just comes at you, and you just deal with it, or you don't deal with it, and things fall apart or work out or whatever. And the historian, you pile the documents up on the table, and they just sit there. You know, if you don't take the time to read them and study them, they'll be there 100 years from now. So you actually have to exercise something called self-discipline, which is not something I'm overrun with. One. Two, I don't really like hard work, and that is hard work. So I've got to get my brain around how I do that, and my approach to it now is to shuffle paper around and restack my files and stuff to make it look better. So I've got it looking good. Whether or not I can make make my brain feel good, that's another, that's another question. Well, I see my friends Sandy and Nelson Barnett from Batesville who are here. I've got an idea for you. I think they're public libraries all over Arkansas that could use your expertise to come in and help them think big, think out of the box, do things differently. Um, and 
again, show them how to pass millages. Uh, have you thought about doing that? Well, I talked to libraries every once in a while, but in fact, base was what the interest I talked to them. Course, and they, yeah, you know, I think it's, it's hard to get people to take a chance on running an election. They don't know how to run them. They haven't done very much, and um, you know, it's a risk. It's a risk that you have to take on when you're when you're doing that. But my answer is always, well, you won't be any worse off than you are now. You might as well try it. And so I think you have to get people to screw up their courage a little bit. You have to get some good local leadership uh, to get behind it. And I, 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 I believe this library, or if you look at Arkansas, urban libraries are doing pretty good. Rural libraries are in big trouble. And one of the best things a rural community could do to help its community is build a library in it. Uh, they desperately need that, but it's a hard sell. Uh, and I wish the state, frankly, would, would uh, put the emphasis on funding rural libraries, not worry so much about urban libraries, because they'll take care of themselves. Have you been to the Heber Springs Library? Have you seen that? I have. And they've done a good job on that, and there's some great, you know, across it, uh, it's got a good library. Uh, there's some great libraries that have been built. And I think that's that's contagious. I think the more people see them, the more they want to do them. They just need help to get it get it done. All right, real quick, let's, let's play the, let's play, I'm going to give you a name, you give me a thought. We're going to move away from libraries and other stuff. The first thing I want to ask you about is, well, I know, but we're going to do three or four things. I got to get this on the table. <laughs> Prisons. <laughs> the library is so much better than prisons. I, I, I spent about ten years dealing with prisons. Uh, uh, I guess what I learned from very quickly is we're trying. All of us in this room are trying to solve problems. There's some problems that, that there's no solution to. They're intractable. Prisons are that to me, and, and they're, everybody's a victim. You're a victim because you're paying for them. The victims are victims because they got victimized. The criminals are victims because they're in jail. And their families are victims because their loved ones are in jail. Now, who won on that deal? No one. Uh, and it's taking money out of higher ed and every other place to do. Uh, but I, I spend more time with them than I like, and I don't want to see them anymore. <laughs> Knox Nelson. Well, he's an old bull from the from the old days in the in the General Assembly. That uh, um, well, what can I say about Knox? Knox got me kicked off one board. He, I've got a great film of him calling me out about what a sorry son of a bitch I was uh, right in front of the Legislative Council. But you know, the the old system, and in a way, term limits was a good thing because it cleared out a lot of that stuff. Uh, but on the other hand, you lost a lot of your your corporate knowledge and you lost a lot of, uh, of people that needed to be there. And, I, and the best example I can think of is John Miller. Mr. Miller, Representative Miller, he's one of the smartest guys I ever met. He worked as hard as anybody I've ever known at, at government. He's the only person that could talk to Bill Clinton and they could understand each other. I wouldn't know what either one of them was talking about. They understood the government. Uh, and my experience with the General Assembly was it was no better or no worse than probably if all of us in here started trying to vote. There'd be some people that'd be real smart and hard working. There'd be some people that'd be crooks. There'd be some people that'd be lazy. Uh, that's what the General Assembly was. But, but people like, like John Miller were, were an asset to this stuff. Knox, not so much. Uh, Bobby Roberts and Richard Nixon. Well, I voted for Richard Nixon. Um, in fact, I don't think I voted for a Democrat about 1976. And I did not vote. I did not vote for Clinton when he ran for Attorney General, just a full confession. I voted for Clarence Cash. Got a base for you. <laughs> <laughs> a good candidate. Okay, Helena. Helena? Oh, you know, it'll always be my hometown to me. I remember taking Cass over there and just looking at it and thinking, how can you think so much of this town? I say, well, you have to see it like it was, not like it is. Uh, it, it, it's bottomed out, I think, like a lot of towns in the Delta have. Uh, I have every hope that it'll come back. Uh, there's a group that I'm meeting with now, people in the Delta trying yet again to do something to help the Delta, but it's a tough, it's a tough sell when you get down that far. I tell people, if you took the city of Little Rock and, and cut the population in half, that's what you have in Helena. How well you think Little Rock would be doing? And how quickly you think it could get back? Not very fast. That's what you're facing a very difficult situation. Hillary Clinton. Uh, I think she'll be the next president. <laughs> Asa Hutchinson. I think he's done a good job as, as governor. I think he's a moderate. I think he got a pretty good election this time. He might be able to keep the private option. I hope he does. 
um, I, I, I'd say the same thing about Huckabee. I think Huckabee was a good, moderate Republican governor. I think Asa Hutchins is going the same way. Little Rock City government. Well, we've got a <laughs> we've got a system that's hard to run. Uh, you got a mayor that's elected with 40% of the vote. You've got a city manager that actually controls a lot of the budgets and what's going on. You got a you got a city board that's half that, that's half at large and, and half in districts. That makes it very difficult to form a working coalition. And I think that's the that's the problem. I think Little Rock has a lot of potential. I think there's a lot of smart people in city government and on the city board. But if the structure if the structure doesn't allow you to function, you you can't you can't, all the goodwill, all the money, and all the skill won't overcome a bad structure. And I think we have a bad structure. If that were, if that were corrected in some way, we'd have, we'd have a, a more dynamic government. Expansion, of, inter expansion, expansion of Interstate 30. Well, I think that's going to have to be done. I don't think that's something you can, you can just take off the board. I think the question becomes, how do you do it? You know, can you do it in such a way that it softens its impact on, on this area? We could go on forever. I would. I could keep this going on all afternoon. But I think it's fair to say that that no one, no one, has done more for Little Rock, for Arkansas, for education, for libraries than Bobby Roberts.